The feedback on breaking out of hell has actually been, it's been really good. It's been really positive. Um, it was, it's the right track to go with first. It's a real airborne sounding song. It's a bit heavier than maybe what we're used to. Um, well, well, you know, but we're not really used to it. It's, it's kind of like the way we play songs live is breaking out of hell. See, if we mm. recorded that 10 years ago or something or five years ago, it'd be a bit slower, maybe a bit tamer. But we just, on this album, a lot of it is just play it like you play it live. So, yeah, it's, it's been really good. And it's been going down well live. I mean, we had Circle Pits a bunch of times mm. to it already. And, and they're really, they're singing all the words. So it's, it's going down well. Yeah. I think when you got a line like "I'm a crazy motherfucker," you know, then, then and I just don't care. I think that speaks to a lot of a lot of rock and rollers. That's classic airball. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were saying no, no ballads, no bullshit. <laughs>
heavy and tough, it's become sort of soft and shit, for want of a better word. You kind of feel robbed and you go, oh, I hate that band now. Or, or you go, oh, I can't listen to them anymore. And you feel robbed, cheated. And, um, and one of the, uh, we fundamentally can't do anything completely different than what we do. So, you know, you're in good hands if you're an Airborne fan because, you know, we're, we're the same as our fans. We, we love the same kind of music. Um, and we're never going to cheat you. It's 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 kind of like it's kind of like asking a um, you know a bartender to uh, to go to go build a house. You know he's going to get you know he's going to get drunk and you build the house. But it's going to be shit. But he'll make you a yeah, great drink. Probably have a good bar. Probably. Yeah, he'll have a great bar, but the house will be shit. It'll fall <laughs> down. You know, so we're kind of like it's kind of like yeah, we're like that. We're just a Jack Daniels and Coke. Why change it? You know, why do you have to add lemon to it? It's kind of like just Jack Coke ice. Just make it a double. Yeah, make yeah. it a double. You know, yeah. And then that's you know, exactly the mentality. Make it a double, and then so uh, on the, we, that was the yeah. We tried to just make it a double, and that's it. <laughs> just fit more in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs>
it's just in Australia we have a lot of power coming out of the wall. <laughs> so, so I guess it pushes the amps harder, and we were like, we need to get that on tape. And you know, a lot of time we were distorting the mics, you know, back home. But um, we we got there in the end. But um, yeah, there was something about that Aussie power in mm. in the amps. So yeah, it's good. Uh, yeah, we, we do have a check. We do have a checklist for every song that goes on the record. Creating songs, there's definitely checklists, um, and like well, from the initial creation, we're not, we're not sitting there checking it off. We just no. we do let it spawn, and then we sort of sit back and maybe go, oh, "That's a bit shit." Chuck it in the bin, or we go, "Hey, there's something with this one." Yeah, and we'll get, that's the demo process. But yeah. then once it comes down to when you're sitting in the studio and you've got to pick the songs, which is always pretty daunting. Um, it's uh, that's vibe. It's all vibe. It's like, you know, there's a, a track on there, Thin the Blood, which you know was one of my personal favourites. Um, I remember in the demo process, I'm pretty sure there were some other ones in its sort of fast category that were yeah. gonna, that were going to top it. But when we got into the studio, sitting there, and there's like the Neve machine, the tape machines running, warming up, and that, and we're going through the demos. It was the one that said, "No, nah, I'm going on the record." And yeah, it stood up. You know, it just stands up. Hearing it at home and then hearing it in the room with the professional producers and engineers it, and the, yeah. you know you start to, you just hear a song differently and you go, no, we'll track that one, we'll do that one. The main checklist we have is it's from the first show we ever played. Well, not the exact first show, but it's like the second or third. It was at the Criterion Hotel in Warrnambool, and there was there was nobody there. There was the bartender, one guy at the bar that was, um, he, he looked pretty burly, like he was, it was like he had a real fucking hard day, and he didn't, and we had all our amps, you know, going up on stage, and this is like, you know, eight o'clock, first band on, and the security guards are there, and that, it's, Criterion Hotel was a very notorious pub in, in Warrnambool, it's shut down now, like it fights, it was the only pub in Warrnambool where if you got banned from all the other pubs, they let you in, that was the kind of deal, anyway, so he's like, he's seen us setting our amps up, and he goes, you're going to fucking make a racket. You better make a good one. Then we're like, shit, you know. And then so we, we got up and played it. And he, he, he loved it, you know, because it's, it's, it's simple rock and roll. I think he thought it was just going to be like a new metal sound or something because he wasn't up for that. He was either wanting to hear fucking rose tattoo covers or something else. Um, but so our checklist is would it have worked for him at the cry? And then would it have worked for when the cry had, when we sold it out for the first time? 800 people was great. Was it? I know it was like three hundred. No, it was like three hundred. <laughs> so I have. <laughs> um, uh, it looked, looked bigger at the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, yeah. So would it have worked then? And then would it have worked when we got to Melbourne? Then would it have worked when we got to the UK for the first time on that first tour around the UK when we were playing in Sheffield and all these places? And then would it have worked? At Varkin and Donington and these big places and we we go through the whole thing and if you go, yep, it would have worked there, um, you know, and are we first and foremost, we love love playing it and then is it going to work for the kid at home you know, is it going to work, you know, when he's driving to work or whatever or just at home for just people getting drunk, and there's all these little things and you go, yes that all works, that's going on the record and then that's when, that point where you're sitting in with the producer and go, yep, it's still still standing up It was hard to try and figure out yep. what to do. We had a few ideas. Yep. We had some, you know, you know, we had this idea of like barbed wire breaking fists. through some fists, but it just come out looking like extremely nothing against the eighties because we're sort of half living the eighties, but <laughs> <laughs> pretty much fully. But um, but it looked really like it was a bit. It was a bit like oh come on, like yeah. it's a bit no. But so yeah. we 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 kept throwing ideas around, and I kind of I remember when we got the title for the for the for the record because it was one of the last songs that we did. I was like, this is great, this yeah, is awesome, I'm breaking out of hell, this is going to be awesome for our work. And then you start delving into it, um, you know, we attempted to not be very literal, but that didn't work. Well, <laughs> well devils and horns and, well, and we pitchforks didn't do and shit was like the mega literal idea that came back. We were yeah. like, okay, we're not going to do devils and pitchforks. Let's... But funnily enough, um, we were, we were, so we were still working on it and like everything in this album, it's just sort of been like, quick, we've got to get it done, yeah. we've got to, you know, we're going to get get things done and then and, uh, so we the, were, thing, the thing is like with rock and roll and the, what we do sorry to cut in Ryan but what we do with artwork and, and even in the, and especially the songs you write fuck we're going back around the same jungle that every fucking band's been through so you think okay 
Hell's in the title. How many bands have got a Hell title? And then you look, there's Flames on their cover, and then they've got this, and then they've got that. And we're like, Fuck, what are we going to do? You know, we, we're in a box here. How are we going to do it? And then, well, what actually happened was, I was in my bedroom, and we were trying to. We had to get this tour again. Had to get going, and um, we're like, well, we're going to sell something for t-shirts. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> you know, I think I had a quick conversation with the manager. He goes, oh, do you remember? Like, I remember some stuff in the old days that kind of looked like this or like with that. And I was like, oh, yeah. And, like, you know, I looked up some stuff and I was like, and Joel was in the other room. I said, Joel, can you come here? Um, you got any good photos you like? I was I'm just thinking about sticking your head coming through the ground just for a T-shirt. It's, no, it's nothing like It's just yeah. a quick T-shirt. I don't want to be on the cover. Like, I'm just like, I'm just, I just need a quick T-shirt so we can, so when we get to Europe and we start the single tour, um, the kids got something to buy with the dates on the back. You know, yeah. something, something, something they can that, take home that's, that's you know, rocking. So he had a photo he found, just sent it to me, and then I just sent just it off. Search and said, the nearest one on Google. Make it come, come through. And then Ben Brown, a guy that I've been talking to, yeah. that I still talk to for merch, he drew it up, and I was just like... Yeah. And Ben Brown, who, who we'd seen on the Cold Chisel Tour in Australia, he's, he's there. I mean, I guess he's been doing art for them for a few years now, but he's an Australian artist, and he's um, he's got something really unique, kind of like how Iron Maiden have their artwork. As soon as you see it, you just know the guy the way the way his pen works. Mm. And um and with Ben Brown, when Ryan first spoke to him, he's a very Aussie guy and, and very easy to get along with and he's like, Fuck oh, yeah man, that sounds awesome. Like just <laughs> he's he's he reminds us of, you know, people you know, we hang out back you know, down in Warnable. He yeah. wasn't like a real sort of short haired, real savvy sort of dude. He was like, you know, loves rock and roll. The cold chisel stuff we seen was really cool and we were like Fuck, I love the way his stuff, you know, it just speaks. It just jumps out and it has an Australian tone to it. Mm. And then, yeah, and had... Well, know. then he did that and we said, well, that's... Because we were actually, for the single, we were just going to have like a sort of a reddy, dark, sort of red coloured thing, airborne, breaking out of hell. It's going to be simple, which a lot of bands do and it's fine because it's yeah. a single. You don't generally, these days, do much artwork for singles. But in once again, as the deadline was coming up to like minutes... We had that changed out. We said, no, nah, this would be great as single artwork as well. And it'll yep. be match up with the merch, which is yep. connecting dots, as you learn, you know, is always a good thing. Um, and then from then we were saying, well, well, why don't we pursue this more for the record cover? I mean, and it was like, well, we kind of we kind of felt we didn't want to go, you know, the, the usual thing. The usual but then breaking when we out said, of you know what, this is, this is airborne. This is airborne. And then, but, but his artwork's... Yeah, made the it, way he does made it. it cool, and then I've got this big red face now, and all this sort of stuff, and then, mm. and then one of the one of the funny comments came. Well, I, I came, said, came I back. said, I said, look, what we got to do is we, we got to we got to make it like like it currently looks like some crazy dude with long hair. We don't exactly know it's Joel, and when Joel goes out and has a few few jacks, well, he always wears that. Yeah. So I was like, can you put a crocodile yeah. tooth on? It? Put a crocodile tooth, like <laughs> crocodile Dundee. So we got, we got the Aussie thing happening. Um, so that's like, and then with the album artwork, we had this, you yeah, know, it's a skull now, but the single artwork was funny because it was like, it, it's clearly, you could tell it's me. And then it's like, okay, well, it looks like Joel's had a big night on the piss and he's finished off on Curry Mile and had the hottest curry on Curry Mile and his face is red as it gets. So it's pretty funny. Well, that, yeah. that's actually something very funny. Um, you know, we used to say... Um, a lot. I guess we still do. Um, the word cliche is not in our repertoire. In our vocabulary. It's vocabulary, yeah. It's, um, not now, it's because not now a dictionary. For some reason, uh, a lot of people in music, and I guess not, not necessarily, I don't know much about movies, but a lot of people in, mu in music seem to think that they have to keep changing things. Um, and I don't necessarily see why you would change something that's not broken. Well, it's back to that thing, like a Jack and Coke. You know, why would you just all of a sudden put grape juice or something in there? Well, that's like you said before. Tastes a bit shit now. With the record. Can I have a Jack and Coke, please? The perfect, just like, make it a double. The perfect analogy is, yeah, make it a double. Yeah. If you're going to make a record, it's like a, your last one was a Jack and Coke. This one's got to be a double Jack and Coke. Uh, on one of our first ever festival shows, we were on a, a stage. Uh, they had two stages like this and this, and they were actually a little bit apart. And... No one knew who we were. We're in the middle of Australia, in the middle of nowhere, and there was like a, a new radio band, pop band that was playing, and the rockers were over on this stage. They had all the digital lights, and we had all the old school cans, so we were like, yeah, you know, this is the good stage to be on. And um, so we're playing our set, and there was 
no one there because they're all over watching the new radio teen sensation. So, <laughs> so I climbed up. I said, you know, fuck this. In the middle of the set, we've got to get them. So I climbed up the stage the first ever time I climbed up. And I think Ryan's probably looking at me going, what the fuck are you doing? You know? <laughs> and then I got it right up the top and I grabbed the nearest light can. And I pulled the gel out, like we learned to do when we were touring around. And I pulled it out and I shone it on their crowd. And I just kept shining on their crowd until they were like looking at it. And the boys are still playing the riff, you know, dun, 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 dun. And, and then the people started going, what's going on? And then they started coming over. Mm. And then they just kept coming and coming. And I just left the light on them and started doing a solo. The boys kicked it in. We're rocking. We're going, fuck, this is pretty good. And then it's a climb back down. We kicked the song back in. And then... We had a whole crowd there, and we stole their crowd. And then um, it's like, ever since that day, it's kind of like, shit, let's keep climbing. This is a cool moment. Uh, but now, you know, 10 years down the track, promoters everywhere go, oh, here comes those, here comes those airborne Australians. We know one of that mad one's going to go climbing up the thing. So sometimes in Australia we have a lot of possums, and um, uh, to stop them from climbing up, you know, power lines and killing themselves and stuff. They they wrap they actually wrap these sort of big aluminium things around the around the telephone pole so they can't climb up there. So there's been a few times when I've gone to climb and oh they've they've seen me coming, you know, and they've wrapped tarps around. They've it. wrapped stuff so I can't actually get up there. So we've just gone, all right, we need to do something. So I just jump out in the crowd and we do a solo through the crowd or, or, or something else. Um, but yeah there's it's we climb when we can, pretty much is the is the thing. So yeah, it's and it's. There was a time when they said, "All right, well, let's get a harness and let's get cables." And we said, "Look, we're not. This ain't a this ain't a pantomime thing. We're not. You know what I mean? It, we're not. This has never been planned, and it's it's not an airborne thing. It has to be. It's got to be one of those on the cuff, wild things. Every show is its own thing. You don't. We don't want to become one of those bands that plans everything out." I just remember our Australian tours going around and around the back of a van. There was points where we, were, we took swags with us. A swag is like a tent in a sleeping bag. It's just this thing you roll out. And we were sleeping on football ovals and shit. And I remember this one time, those oh, people, yeah. kids were chucking rocks at us and Hooligans. stuff. Hooligans. Hooligans. And then, um, and because we were like living like hobos, pretty much. And um, <laughs> But you learn something every step of the way. Like Ryan said, Like I remember we were playing somewhere in Wollongong, I think it was. And they had the they had like the TAB, which is the like the horse racing. They had dinner, like they had like chicken schnitzels and shit coming out of it. They had plates everywhere. And we're like, what the fuck are we doing in here? You know, we're in a restaurant, you know. And the, the, like, we're setting up, and no one's really caring about the band. It's just like Jesus Christ, it's loud. And then so I jumped on the tables and like kicked their dinner over and just gave them a solo. And you know, then they got into it. They didn't really care about the dinner. They were like, okay, let's. This is exciting. And then it's like Ryan was saying. So then you learn, hey. When the crowd's not into it, you've got to do something. You've got to get them in. So then when you'd go around like all those spots and you finally get to the point where we supported the Rolling Stones at, at Rod Laver Arena in Melbourne, it was like the biggest gig ever. We finally got to that point and it was like, shit, we're supporting the Stones. With it. Like, you know, it's only us and them. It's just we've we got, we got to lift. So we brought amps in from Adelaide. Brought every we brought amp amps in. amps in from Sydney. Um, the, got the lights all the, sorted. The, we have brought in our own lighting director. We'd never done that. The loaders that were working on the day said that they'd never. The last time they loaded in that many amps was for the Stiff Up Lip Tour. ACDC for tour. ACDC. <laughs> um, and we were still a very young band. We were doing those small clubs, but our demo managed to get to the Stones, and we played yep. that show, and we played our yep. hearts out. Yep. We, we, you know, we, we focused on everything, and Joel was out there doing, doing his the thing. Doing the solo, and, and when we walked off stage. Yeah, and when we walked off stage, we had the entire the Stones crew giving us a big clap and saying, you know, best fucking band to support Stones in 15 years. We, we wouldn't have been able to do that yeah. if, had we not played every little shithole in the corner of every little town. To learn your craft. Um, sex, alcohol, rock and roll is, is kind of um, what our record pretty much would sum it up, um, which is kind of what we do. Because um, it's all fun to sing about and play, and you know, go out there every night and play songs about it. it's. That's really fun. I love. Yeah. My one of my favorite things is got a bucket of beers next to me, and halfway through the show, it's like once we're warmed in and we're really good, it's like you crack a beer and you're sort of having a beer with the crowd, and you're all. It's a really fun thing, and that's that's why we keep doing what we're doing. That's why we love touring, is because 
every every song and every night and everything we do, we're 100 percent passionately behind and love doing. Yeah, and the crowd like, they really love to sing. Our crowds really love to sing, so we, we want to make sure that you know what, what they're singing. They're having fun too, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think with this album, I think there's got a lot of good things, and we're going to have a lot of good times on tour with it. It's going to be great.